Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. So what do we want to look at today in terms of repairs? What do we do if we have a fractured denture? Has anybody had a broken denture in half that they've had to deal with so far? So, you know, it'll be a review for some of you. A fractured or a damaged tooth? Okay, we can also go through, or we'll go through modification of a temporary partial denture or partial post-dam modification and clasp repair. So if we look at a fractured denture first, the way we usually repair these things is either with polymethylmethacrylate, that's a self-curing acrylic, or we can use the pink colored triad material. And here's an example where there was a little bit of a flange broken off the denture, but it's the same, it would be exactly the same procedure if the denture were broken in half right down the middle. So the fact that in this case there's a corner broken off it, the technique is exactly the same if it's broken right down the middle. Now sometimes what makes this process more difficult, we just had one in our clinic last week. When polymethylmethacrylate breaks, if a patient brings it in, the two pieces where the fracture plane where polymethylmethacrylate breaks is an extremely crisp and clean fracture plane. So when you put the two pieces back together, there's really no question whatsoever about how they fit because the two pieces will mate very perfectly. There's one exception. Anybody have any idea what the exception is? The patients will oftentimes try to repair their own denture with a glob of superglue. And if patients put a big glob of superglue on these mating surfaces, superglue will actually melt the plastic a little bit. And with patients, they're just like dental students are. If a little is good, a lot must be better. And a whole lot must be a whole lot better. Not true. So then what happens is the patient comes in and these two pieces that originally would have mated together very nicely no longer fit worth a darn. And so sometimes you have to go to plan B, C, or D. But the hope is when the patient comes in, it's been broken, they haven't tried to fix it with super glue. And then if you take literally one drop, one drop of the real runny super glue, put it on one of the mating surfaces and just hold the two pieces together for about 10 seconds, it will weld them together. That's not your repair, okay? That's not your repair. The only reason that you stick things together, and the thing I think we'll show for this particular example, is doing some sticky wax. So that's why one person is holding it together real carefully, and then someone you trust not to drip the sticky wax on your finger or thumb, drip some sticky wax on, but you can accomplish the same thing if you put one drop of super glue on the fracture plane, and then go ahead and tack it together. So now that the two pieces where the fracture has occurred are tacked together, what we want to do is pour some sort of an index on the inner aspect of the denture. So what we do in this particular case is it happens to be a quick setting plaster index. And so up in the clinic, the stuff you folks would have would be mounting plaster. So if you make a creamy mix of mounting plaster and put on the inside of the denture, it will basically make an index so that those two pieces of plastic, when they're fractured apart again intentionally to do your repair, can be re repositioned so they're in the correct orientation. Now the indices that we make may be made out of plaster, they may also be made out of PVS, and they may also be made out of alginate, and you'll see examples of both of those later on. So here we have the index made, and again, whatever the index material is inside your fractured denture, like I say, here it happens to be quick set plaster. It could be PVS injected on the in inside of it. I'll usually use medium or heavy body, so you get sort of a rubber model. It's an expensive model, but depending on the situation, it can be worth it. You could also use alginate. So now that we've got the index made, then if we clean off our sticky wax, or if this thing had one drop of super glue in this, in this spot, you could take the denture off and then intentionally break these two pieces apart again. So here you've got your two pieces. The repair is not done, but they now fit on an index. So what we then do is bevel the oral surface, that is bevel this fracture so that when we put the repair acrylic in here, it has a broader area of contact. So if you look at this thing from the side, you'll see how on the tissue most aspect of the fracture, we didn't cut it apart a lot. But we beveled both sides back on the side that faces the tissue 
And there's a little bit of opening here, not a problem, because the index we poured on the inside of the denture captured the shape of the tissue surface of this. So we bevel this back for two reasons. One is it freshens the acrylic, because when the acrylic has been in contact with spit, some of the spit microscopically soaks into the surface of the plastic and contaminates the surface. So if you go to put fresh repair acrylic on that contaminated surface, it doesn't bond as tenaciously as it does if you will cut that surface back a little bit, exposing fresh polymethylmethacrylate that's never seen spit. So when you go to put your repair medium on there, it tends to stick better. It bonds better. And then the reason that you bevel back from the fracture line is can you see you have a larger surface area for your repair material to grab onto. So what we do in this case is if we've got some self-repair acrylic and this stuff is available at the dispensing desk, it's a self-curing pink repair acrylic. So it's the usual thing, a dappen dish of liquid, a dappen dish of powder. If you've got the plastic dappen dishes, whatever, liquid and powder. Moisten the fractured surfaces with some monomer on a Q-tip. I tend to like these sable brushes in the black wooden handles as opposed to the little throwaway nylon brushes they want to try to give you because the nylon brushes aren't nearly as good for picking up small increments of repair acrylic. One can also do the repair with the triad material. I don't like the triad material as well because it bonds pretty well, but I think the triad material being a composite is quite brittle. So for those of you that have made trays or record bases from triad, you're aware that if you drop them on the floor, they tend to shatter. And so I think in function, the polymethyl methacrylate repair, in my experience, is a little tougher tends to hold up better and not refracture. This is particularly the case if a maxillary denture, for example, would be fractured right down the midline. And we see that fairly commonly. So in this situation, we would have freshened the cutback surfaces with a little bit of uh, monomer. We put some bonding liquid on the fracture and then take some of the pink repair triad and just press it on very nicely. What we're doing up here is having a little dappen dish of just regular acrylic monomer and what works well for that is if you dip an instrument in it to just smooth this material off. It doesn't increase the bonding, it's just a handy lubricant to smooth that material off. Then you put your air barrier coating. This stuff again prevents oxygen from coming in contact with the surface of the triad as it's curing so that when it's fully cured this air barrier coating, and that's the large jug of material back there that's sort of like a big jug of clear liquid snot. It's not, it's not the uh, Vaseline question. Is it the, shape of, um, the, the particular triad, there isn't. So if you have a dark, characterized uh, denture for an African-American patient or for another patient, the triad itself that we have doesn't come in different colors. But if you would take the the powder liquid, the polymethyl methacrylate. If we know we've got a, a repair coming in, if we call like Ward's Dental Lab or Sharp's Dental Lab, they have got some, some shaded or some toned repair acrylics that we don't carry here. The acrylic we've got in stock here is just your standard light fibered pink. And if you need a darker shade, it's not that it doesn't exist. We don't typically stock it, but when we've needed it in the past, if we just call up the lab wherever the denture was made, if we call up Wards or Sharps, could you send us some of your characterized self-repair acrylic? Then they send us a little bit of the powder. The powders work with any of the liquids. And so the fact that we don't need to get special liquid, our liquid works just fine with the powder. So if you've got one coming up that you know is a shaded acrylic, then just call the lab and get some of the equivalent shade in a self-curing acrylic. Yep. Air barrier coating goes on, goes in the triad ovens, out it comes and you polish it. We shape it back with an acrylic burr, we pumice it, and so what we've got here is this is the repair once it's completed and it's pretty much undetectable from the original repair. Question was brought up and it's a very salient question, is if your patient has a characterized or anything other than light fibered pink plastic bases on their dentures, the stuff we normally stock at the desk doesn't match. 
So if you know you've got one of these coming in or if you've seen it, then go ahead and get a hold of Wards or Sharps and they'll send us down just like a, a small amount of the shaded repair acrylic to do the repairs with. So what if we've got a patient that's fractured a maxillary denture but it's not broken in half? So here this thing is that's fractured down here and it goes across here. So we're going to do the same thing. Some people say, what if I just flow a little bit of acrylic right on that fracture line? Won't capillary action sort of suck the acrylic into that little crack and heal the space? Short answer, no. You don't get enough bonding on that. It refractures again about the time they get to the parking structure. So if I'm going to have to go ahead and cut a little channel along this, because this isn't broken in two halves, again, I want some sort of a matrix. So when I flow the acrylic in there to do the repair, it's not running all over the inside of the denture. And that's where we go ahead and we inject medium body PVS or heavy body PVS in the inside of the denture. The beauty of using some sort of a rubbery material is you don't have to block out any undercuts. You just squirt it everywhere, no block out whatsoever, let it set up, and it just comes in and out of the denture just fine. So medium body PVS works just fine for that. So you can see we've made that little index, and so when we take the denture or pull this out of the inside of the denture, this is what the labial aspect looks like. So this represents the inner aspect of the labial portion of the denture. So what we do now is go ahead and take a small acrylic burr and go ahead and just cut that plastic out of there completely, beveling it toward the tissue surface. You put your index back in, so this now captures what the inner aspect of the denture looked like. And then again, a dappened dish of liquid, a dappened dish of powder, dip in the liquid, pick up some powder, and just paint these areas in. And again, if we get some from the dental laboratory, they don't, we don't have these at the desk anymore. Uh, the companies do make kits, if you have these in your office, that give you different shades of self-repairing acrylic with a common bottle of liquid. And so what we typically do is just use self-curing acrylic. Dap and dish of liquid, dap and dish of powder, dip in the liquid, pick up some powder, paint some on. You paint it in a little bit at a time. Again, the thing that you want to remember that dental students try to forget is that water runs downhill. So it shouldn't be a real surprise that if you're holding this the way the photograph is, if you're holding it so the teeth are vertical, yeah? And you paint the stuff on here, where is it going to run? It's going to run all over the labial surface of the teeth, right? I would think that's self-evident. But it's amazing the number of students that don't bother to pick the thing up and hold it. Ugh. So the labial aspect is facing up, so when you go ahead and, and flow the acrylic on it, it just tends to lay there. And if it's on a curved surface, you're a little bit frustrated because you can't do too much of the curve all at once. You've got to pick like a little section and lay it on there. And you keep bathing it in liquid until it gets fairly set up, until it gets leathery. Then you can do the next part, and then you can do the next part. And then put the thing in the pressure pot. And when you fill this pressure pot, you check it out at the desk. It's got a little curly Q hose in it with a bicycle pump valve on the thing. And on the, next to the model trimmer on the end of the clinics closest to the blue clinic is a little quick disconnect that the air hose can plug into. So you fill this thing about two-thirds full of hot water. Put your repair in there, pump it up to 20 PSI or just under 20 PSI. And it will set that acrylic up for you so it's quite hard and resists stains and is stronger. So many times you can't get your entire repair done in one edition because, again, the acrylic wants to slump and run around. So you may go back a couple or three times to do part of it, put it in the pressure pot for about three to five minutes, and then take it out, paint some more on, put it in for three to five minutes, take it out, and you can repair a crack such as that. So there's your before with your crack, and there's your repaired. What if we've got a fractured or a damaged tooth? So a patient comes in, one of the easiest things is if a patient comes in and their tooth just delaminated from the denture. It didn't break. They've got the tooth. They've got the tooth, and it just came out of the denture. And if that were the situation, what you would do is take your medium skinny acrylic burr and just lightly freshen the plastic 
in the little uh, divot that the tooth would have left, slightly freshen the plastic on the lingual of the tooth. The tooth will fit right back in the same spot, relieve a little bit from the lingual aspect or the palatal aspect, and you can flow repair acrylic in there, and it will seal very nicely. In this situation, the tooth itself was fractured. So one hopes that somewhere in the record, and those of you that make dentures for patients, please, in big, bold printing, in the Form 6, so that Helen Keller could see it, okay, put the mold and shade of the teeth that you use. And so if the patient shows up in two years with a broken tooth like this, no problem. We'll just go ahead and check out an equivalent tooth from the desk, single central incisor, and then we'll go ahead and grind things out and fix it. So we whip open the Form 6 to look for the shade and mold of the tooth, and it ain't there. And so then you get out your shade guide and mold guide and do the best you can to match the tooth. In a dental office, you're not going to have a big stock of teeth. So you would just have a nice relationship with the friendly neighborhood dental laboratory that was physically close to you. So if you were practicing in Ann Arbor, an easy thing might be to do would be to have a relationship with Sharp's Dental Lab. Because if the patient wants to drop this off in the morning, and pick it up later in the afternoon, can you see it doesn't work to send it up to Dental Arts in Lansing for one of those quick turnaround things? So there, wherever you are, unless you're in Gander Bay, Newfoundland, or someplace like that, there should be a dental lab within reasonable proximity of you so you can go ahead and have a relationship with them, send the denture over to them, and they'll just do the repair and get it back to you. If it's one of those situations where in your office, if you purchase some self-repair acrylic, and one of these pressure pots, you can be an extreme hero to some patients if you can go ahead and set them in a spare room or have them read a magazine in the waiting room while you go ahead and do the repair with some self-repair acrylic right in your office. Then that's a, that can be a real practice builder uh, and they think you're really a nice person because you, kept, you got it back to them right away. So what we do here is just clean out the divot where the tooth used to be. Now again, if the tooth came out intact, you would see a recess like this on the denture that you would just lightly freshen the acrylic with this medium skinny acrylic work. And then freshen the acrylic on the inner aspect of the tooth and put it right back in place. Here again we shape the tooth so that the tooth fits appropriately in that. So to stabilize the tooth in there, what happens a lot of times is it's helpful to put a little teeny dollop of sticky wax in this incisal corner and on this incisal corner to stabilize this tooth. Because when this thing's just sitting in here, it'll fall, it'll fall out. It doesn't want to stay put that well. So here again, we take our self-curing acrylic, dap and dish a liquid and powder paintbrush, and then go ahead and, again, what the circles are for here was you could put a little bit of sticky wax just on those corners to stabilize the tooth. Dip in the liquid, pick up some powder, paint it in, cure the thing, finish it and polish it, and you're good to go. Here's a tooth that's broken on a partial denture right next to a clasp area. Similar kind of a thing. We basically, you can see how this was just ground out so that we ground out the area where the tooth set. We got a replacement tooth, same size, shape, and color, and then went ahead. So again, you're not going to, out in practice, you're not going to stock a bunch of these things. So you can make, you know, one of these bonded repairs, but usually you're going to be better off if you have some relationship with the lab in reasonably close proximity that you can just send it to the lab and they'll return it as quick as is possible. And so that again just shows grinding things out, finishing it up, trying the tooth in, grind the tooth to fit where we hollow it out, we get things so they fit, bond them back in. On this one, we use a little sticky wax to flow it in place. So here's our repair. Again, back in the pressure pot, we're usually going to blow the pressure pot up to around 20 PSI. There's a little pressure relief valve right here on the pressure pot. So if you try to put a lot more air pressure, it'll just start hissing and it will let the air out of the pressure pot so it can't go too high. So what if we have a temporary partial or some sort of a partial? Patient's going to have teeth extracted. We know the patient's going to have teeth extracted, so they've had some sort of a flipper that's being converted to a full denture because they're having their teeth out. 
So what one can do in that situation is, if you go ahead and just take an alginate impression of the patient's partial in place the day they come in for the surgery, and this would presume that you yourself are not doing the surgery. Or if you were in a private office, then you train your auxiliaries how to do this. So can you see if you just take a nice alginate impression with the partial in place, and then typically the partial will come out with the impression, what we're going to do is take an appropriate colored repair acrylic and pour it directly right into the impression. So if you just take an appropriate shade of repair acrylic and just flow it right into the, just, you know, pour the alginate up with tooth colored acrylic but you're only pouring the alginate up to come up to the tissue surface of the tissue side of your temporary partial. So don't overfill this grossly. Just fill the clinical crown aspects up and what's going to happen is this polymethyl methacrylate will bond very nicely to the plastic that's already there with your temporary partial. Now can you see when you separate this thing out, we'll have teeth on it, but we won't have any labial flange on the labial aspect of that. So when we pour acrylic in just to form the teeth, then the next thing you want to do is go ahead and you can just pour this impression up in either uh, stone, whatever your pleasure is. And so what we've done now is we poured the teeth in there. Now we just quickly poured a quick setting plaster model in that. So when we separate the impression from the quick setting plaster model, here's our original partial, and here's the plastic teeth that we just poured in the alginate. And what we can do here now is just paint pink repair acrylic down here to create a flange on this. And this is all done pretty quickly. This does not take a long time. And so again, dap and dish of liquid, dap and dish of powder, paint the acrylic on the labial aspect on that model, take it off and trim it, and then again, depending on which shades of repair acrylic you have, you can get these teeth to match better than we did here. This is a situation in which we didn't have a lot of different shades of repair acrylic. But again, what was this for? To take a plastic transitional partial denture and convert it to a full denture with the extraction of the few remaining teeth. In reviewing, what did we do? We took an alginate impression. We first poured the teeth themselves up in the alginate and just tooth colored acrylic, then poured a plaster model on the inside of it and painted on labial or buckle flanges to give us a flange on the denture. We polish and smooth those and it can be delivered. Here's the same kind of a thing on a maxillary case. We had a maxillary flipper. Okay, there were a few teeth that were remaining. They didn't respond well to perio treatment or whatever. It was decided we're going to take these teeth out. Alginate impression, pick the partial up in the alginate. Just pour acrylic directly into the impressions of the teeth. Pour a model and then go ahead. Here's your plastic tooth that's bonded onto this pink plastic. Here's another one. We're going to just paint a flange on the outside of this on our model. So we paint the flange on and we've essentially converted this flipper to a full denture without too much trauma for the whole thing. In this case, what we did was the tooth was extracted before the patient got to us. And so we wanted to then, after the fact, add a tooth in this area, add a tooth in this area. So what we did this time was just basically poured alginate into the underside of the partial so we could take a scalpel and just carve this area back. So we'll then just add pink acrylic there and just arbitrarily set the tooth in the pink acrylic. Dap and dish a liquid and powder in a paintbrush. Trim an appropriate tooth so that it's the right height occluso cervically. Just arbitrarily build up and dollop up some pink repair acrylic there. Keep putting just a little bit of monomer on the pink acrylic until it gets somewhat doughy. And when it gets like pizza dough or silly putty, you can literally just take the tooth and squish it or set it right into the partially polymerized acrylic, paint a little bit more monomer on it, and then you've converted this, added a tooth to it, and then what we did with this is relined it with a temporary soft liner. Post-dam modification. You deliver a denture, patient comes in, says, gee, the denture doesn't stay up very well, or they've worn a denture for a long time. They come back to you and you look in the record and it was one that somebody made a year ago 
that's now graduated. So you inherited this case that's a year or so old, and the student that made it had graduated. Patient says it doesn't stay up very good for me. So if the denture doesn't stay up very good for a maxillary denture, most common reason is either inadequate extension of the denture on these corners by the tuberosity areas, or potentially an inadequate posterior palatal seal. So if one is going to consider repairing this area on the denture, the very first thing I want to do is take some fluid wax, that stuff that's called Iowa wax, and it doesn't photograph that well. If you look closely, you'll see there is a skin of wax across the posterior aspect of the denture that shapes somewhat that butterfly shape that we try to make for our posterior palatal seals. And you can see over here it comes just slightly through the hamming or notch. If I feel that these areas in the back corners are deficient, I might actually drag out the dreaded, dreaded border molding compound and see if I could go ahead and develop these corners just a little bit. Now the reason that I do that ahead of time is if the patient complains about retention of the upper denture. And I go in either with compound or wax diagnostically and rework this posterior area of the denture. Let's say for the sake of argument that I do that, and when I'm done with all that, the retention doesn't really seem any better. I mean, I've really done it about as good as I can, and it still falls right down. Anybody think of what are some possible reasons why a patient's maxillary denture might have really crummy retention? Okay, amount of saliva. Either they got no saliva or the saliva they do have is extremely serous saliva. You know the stuff that's real runny? The stuff that makes the best retention for dentures is that really ropey saliva. The one that slaps you on the rubber cup, you know, when you're doing profies. <laughs> you take it out and there's this thing that's about that long, but it won't break, it won't snap off, it just keeps sort of whipping around there like that, okay? If somebody's got spit like that, then they're probably gonna do really, really good with an upper denture. Because with that stuff as an interfacial surface tension provider, stays in real good. If somebody's got that really, really clear, runny stuff that just has no, it's just, ugh, it's just like, I don't know what, lighter fluid or something. Those people have a tougher time. So they might either have really the wrong kind of saliva or no saliva or a really poor anatomical shape to the maxillary ridge, really flat. And some other people I've had trouble with are people with extremely round faces and really tight cheek muscles. And it feels like no matter how they move their, their mouth or lips at all, the depth of their vestibule, the cheek muscles are so tight that it lifts up away from the denture. So if people have these really round faces and high tight cheeks, sometimes with those people, that if, if this is the depth of the vestibule and that's the denture flange going up in the depth of the vestibule and this is out toward the cheek, that area out toward the cheek, anytime they move their lips at all, that area out toward the cheek is flexing up and letting air over the top. And with some of those situations, reworking my posterior palatal seal ain't going to do anything for me. And so if I do lay on the, the Iowa wax or do a little border molding or whatever, and the retention doesn't seem to improve significantly, if you do it all, it's like, well, maybe it's a little better, I guess. Stop. Don't bother to go any further because when you turn this whole thing into plastic, your retention won't be any better if it's good as what you started with. So first, if you diagnostically sort of try these things to say, okay, does the amount of retention improve significantly. Second thing you folks always want to do, somebody comes in, they complain about retention of their upper denture. The very first thing you do is you slap a PVS in it and say, well, just reline it and that'll fix everything. So you take a reline impression, you send it off to the lab, you get it back, you try it in, and it's just as crummy as it was before. Just as crummy. So again, if they come in with poor retention of an upper denture, what's one of the first things you can do to see if you've got relative intimacy of contact between the denture and the tissue? What's something you can check with? PIP paste. And so that's what I would do is put a thin, thin film of PIP paste on the upper denture, seat it real firmly, and if I have significant unevenness in the burn-through pattern, 
it is okay to grind down the intaglio surface of a denture where you see tons of burn through and then reapply the PIP paste and put it in. And at the time you take the denture and you're getting pretty uniform burn through pattern on the real thin layer of PIP paste you put in, surprisingly many times the retention goes up markedly, a lot. And you didn't send it off to the lab and you didn't have to reline it, you just made sure that the inner aspect of the denture had some semblance of being able to fit. Now, if the denture's 20 years old, I'm probably not going to bother doing that a lot, right? Because I'm assuming there's probably going to be a poor fit. But if the denture's not that old and they're having problems, that's what I'm going to check. Let's say for the sake of argument, we figure out it is the post dam. So we go ahead and we pour a plaster index on the inside of the denture. And then what we do is once the plaster index has been poured, so this captures the tissue surface, and you can see here a little bit where we've put our Iowa wax in to give us a little more indentation for the posterior palatal seal. And then this is the part that freaks students out. I go to the arbor band and I cut the back end of the denture off completely. It's like, oh my, what did you do? Oh my God, where am I going to go from here? <laughs> so you sit the thing back down on your model. So you got your model. Now remember, your model did a really good job of capturing very intimately what the tissue surface of that denture looked like. And this is one of those areas. Can you see that, and it used to be all we had, that if I'm trying to paint this entire area across here with a dappened dish of liquid, a dappened dish of powder, and acrylic, that when I'm painting it in here, it works fine. But when I try to paint it over the tuberosity areas, it all wants to slump back in the middle. Pain in the butt. Takes forever. So this is one of those things that this is the perfect indication for use of that triad material. So what you do here is, again, on the posterior aspect where we've cut it back, I would bevel this. I would bevel the plastic toward the t oral side, away from the tissue side. I'd put bonding liquid along there. There's that bonding liquid back with the triad material. Comes in a little brown bottle. So I'd put bonding liquid on there and then cure that and then take a sheet of the pink triad material, cut a strip of it, and very carefully adapt it to this really well. And you can do a beautiful job of adapting that. Put the air barrier coating on it, put it in and cure it for 10 minutes, and then you've got a new posterior border on your denture. And again, you wouldn't even bother doing this if you didn't see a marked improvement in retention when the patient came in complaining of retention and you tried to diagnostically put some fluid wax or something along the posterior aspect of the denture to see if that worked better. And if it did, you go through this procedure and it will give you a new back end on that denture that will give you significantly better retention. This is one where we took basically a reline of a denture. So this was in the old days when we would do immediates or if a denture's been out there longer and we said, okay, let's do a reline of the denture. And then on the inner aspect of the reline, we put the fluid wax. This was a kind we used to use called Correcta wax. This is what the Iowa wax replaces. And so we'd have that set up. Here again, the posterior palatal seal. What is it that that thing's supposed to do? So in any individual, when they go ahead and wear the denture, you want the maxillary denture to stop at the junction of the hard and soft palates. And so the hard and soft palate junction, we want to have a little bit of an extra bead of the denture going up in the air. Reason being, when a person sneezes, swallows, yawns, does lots of different things, this area of the soft palate where the uvula hangs down here can flex up. It goes up in the air. If this area of the uvula flexes up in the air, what it can allow is a little bit of air to come over the top edge of the back of the denture. And that can cause the denture to break its suction. So the working of the posterior palatal seal is to give us just a little extra beading of that area right there so that we maintain seal if the soft palate moves. So if you look at the posterior aspect of a denture in cross-section, so we say, okay, here's the tuberosity, goes up to the roof of the mouth, comes down for the other tuberosity, okay? Then we go ahead and we build a denture that's on this. So we got a denture that's built here. Here's teeth. And then here's our denture flange that sort of fits 
along in this area supposedly intimately. Now what happens when we process a denture and the denture is removed from the stone cast? So it's turned from wax into plastic, it's all processed, and at the lab they break away the stone model. What happens to the dimension of this acrylic looked at in cross-section is it tends to shrink toward the middle just a little bit. So areas that are out here on the outer aspect would actually maybe pull in tighter and rub tighter. People follow that okay? But the areas that are in here where you've got the inner aspect of the palatal vault going up, in this area, the denture, like if I blow it up, would tend to pull away a little bit here and here. People follow that okay? So you got this curved shape of the denture, and if it's going to shrink a little bit to the center, where it fits the roof of the mouth, if it shrinks in there, it's going to separate. And can you also see that the deeper a person's vault is, the deeper their vault is, the more pronounced the pull away is. If a person's maxilla, I wouldn't love it, but if a person's maxilla was as flat as a pool table, so it was just straight across, if things shrunk to the middle, can you see that would cause no vertical separation? But if I got a really V-shaped ridge, it almost looks like a submucous cleft. So there's this incredibly deep vault going up there that's damn near vertical. Now when things shrink to the middle, now I got more problems in there. People follow that okay? Now the secondary thing that happens is, if you look at this now, here's in cross section, let's look at it from the top. Tuberosity, tuberosity, palatine fovea, midline. So what happens basically is when we talk about the depth and the shape of the posterior palatal seal, right at the midline and right at the hem inner notches, the carpet padding under the mucosa is fairly thin. If you take a ball burnisher and you go to push on these areas, if you push here and here and here, it's not all that squishy. The carpet padding is fairly thin. So when you're making the depth of your post dam that we talk about that butterfly shape, so we come not to, but through the hem inner notch, and then we give a little blip up here, come back, little blip, come back, and around here. Why the blips going forward here? Two reasons. These are the areas where we're most likely to get the air leak because, again, of the shrinkage of the denture. When it went up, it pulls away. Yeah? Those are also the areas where the carpet padding is the thickest. The accessory salivary glands, the submucosal fatty tissue, those kinds of things are thicker in here and in here. And so sometimes if the soft palate moves up in the air, and the soft palate moves up in the air and tends to drag the tissue up just a little bit, can you see that the thicker the tissue is, the squishier the tissue is, if my fist, here's my hard palate, my, there's my soft palate moving up and down, yeah, and this fist is the back end of my denture. So my denture back end of it ends right at my knuckles. So here's your hard palate, here's your soft palate, here's your denture, soft palate drapes down. When the soft palate blouses or moves up, can you see that the thicker the tissue is here, it might pull that tissue up a little bit more and let air leak over the top? So the thicker the subcutaneous connective tissue is in those areas, the more compressibility exists on this very back edge of the hard palate. You're still on the hard palate, but you're at the very back end of it. And there's some thickness to the skin, and especially some thickness to the subcutaneous connective tissue. So the thicker it is, if this flexes up a little bit, it's going to drag that tissue up a little and let air leak over the top. And that's why we make these things a little bit deeper and a little bit broader in these areas. Now the other thing that people want to remember is, again, for even some of my colleagues uh, that will do these with fluid wax, uh, some of my colleagues, if I look at the shape of a maxillary denture, In the old days, I've seen them do it. So when they get done with the fluid wax onto this thing, and it's like, what in the hell is that? Because they'll say, well, gee, I'll get a better seal. I'll get a better seal. If we want, basically, if we want the denture to displace this tissue just a little bit, can you see the only thing keeping the denture in place is interfacial surface tension and spit? There is no wing nut that this thing screwed up in there with. So can you see that there's a limit to how much soft tissue you can displace? 
So if the air is going to leak, where is it going to leak? It's only going to leak over this very, very back edge. So these post dams don't need to be that wide in an anterior, posterior direction because you can't displace that much tissue up because all you got holding the denture in is spit and interfacial surface tension. So by trying to cover a much broader area with your post dam, you get the net effect of what I call this then acts like snowshoes or cross-country skis. So you don't compress the tissue at all because you can't compress the tissue that much. So now what happens basically is it sort of touches up here by the incisive papilla. It touches back here and it's sort of out of contact in a lot of these areas and you wind up with not that great a retention. So making post dams extremely wide in an AP direction is not necessarily a great idea. And making them really deep isn't a real great idea because if you say real, I'll take my burr and I'll just cut this sucker in here really deep. Man, we got a groove in here. Ooh, it's just kicking butt. What do you suppose you're going to see when the patient comes back for their first, and maybe when you deliver it, it's got great retention. <sighs> okay, what do you suppose you see when they come back for their first post-insertion adjustment? Their tissue is redder than that, this marker is right there. It's bleeding, it's ulcerated, it just hurts like hell. And for you, just to make them comfortable, you can't just go zzz, 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 and put it, oh, that feels so much better. No, 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 no. You've got to hog and grind and hog and grind until it, finally they can tolerate having it back in, yeah? Because the tissue's all red as heck and it's all swollen. Hurts like a SOB, okay? You finally grind it back enough so they can tolerate having it in. Now over the next two days, what happens to the tissue? It shrinks back down and settles down. Now, how, to, how retentive do you suppose your denture is? Not at all. And so areas that you don't want to screw around with too much are don't overreach the mark for these post dam areas because it'll cause soreness post-insertion. And then when you try to adjust it, you're going to overshoot the mark and the denture is going to lose retention. And then you're like a dog chasing its tail or snowball rolling downhill trying to get this thing back where it would have been in the first place. So don't make your post dams way too wide AP. Don't make them grossly too deep. As deep as I make the post dams are half the diameter of the end of that medium skinny acrylic burr. You know, your tall one looks like a tall skinny Christmas tree. Half the diameter of the tip of that burr is deep enough for the post dam. Maybe slightly more than half the diameter in these fleshy areas, but for sure not more than half the diameter at the most at the midline and where it goes through the hem inner notch areas. So if I stop anybody in the clinic in the next six months and say, how come we do a post dam? What's the, what's the function of a posterior palatal seal? Well, to make the denture stay in. Yeah, from what? So what are the two things we're compensating for? One is processing shrinkage of the denture. Remember I talked about that when it shrinks to the middle? And if I've got a steep palatal vault, it may pull away from that in this area. Yeah? Processing shrinkage. Don't be a bit surprised if this shows up on an exam. Don't be a bit surprised. So posterior palatal seal will help compensate for processing shrinkage. What else will it help compensate for? Movement of the posterior aspect of the tissue in the hard palate because of flexure of the soft palate. So when the uvula and the soft palate flexes up, it can compress or cause that tissue at the very back edge of the denture to move up just a little bit away from the processed surface of the denture and let air leak over the back. So it's for basically soft tissue compression or movement where the back of the hard palate goes up and down or compresses a little bit because of the movement of the soft palate. And Dimensional change or processing shrinkage of the denture after processing. That's why we do posterior palatal seals. So here's one. If we've poured a case up, we're just scribing that posterior palatal seal in. I'll typically cut it in with a... Boy, I've really got you folks in the dark, don't I? Whoa. God. Talk about sleepy time. It's like, whoa. So we'll go ahead and cut it in with the burr and then smooth it out with a number seven wax spatula. It works very nicely. And so here's different phases of we poured our index. So we cut the back off. Okay, here's two different ones actually. Look them like the same. And again, the color doesn't match perfectly if I put the pink triad on. 
but it's in an area where it's not seen. It makes a really, really, really nice contact with the tissue. does a beautiful job. Class prepare, we're going to go over very quickly. What we've got here is we'll go ahead and take an impression. Our good old friend, we pour the impression up in medium or heavy body PVS. We get things poured up. We say, gee, in this area, we're going to add a tooth. And we're going to take this eye bar clasp and move the eye bar clasp from here up to here. So we go on the inside of the partial and take a high speed round diamond and we cut the eye bar clasp out of the way so it's now free. I'm going to cut little teeny divots on the side of it to set things in. It's going to go back on my model. So what do I do? We add acrylic here and we add a tooth in so the acrylic and the tooth gets put on and the eye bar gets moved forward to the lateral incisor. Can I always do that? No. Out at the desk, they have some other clasps. They have these pre-made clasps that are either for the left side or the right side. Okay, so I can go ahead and again get a model, take one of those little clasps and some ortho pliers, bend a little loop on these things. When I get the little loop bent on them, they can go ahead and be embedded in self-curing acrylic. So we embed them in the self-curing acrylic and we can add these little clasps on here. These are available at the desk. So here's one where we've added clasps on the side. Here's one where we've added a tooth and moved an eye bar. And again, this is our old friend, the PVS model, injected right into an alginate impression. Why? Because I don't have to block out any undercuts and I can take the partial off and on this model without breaking any teeth on the model. Crown to fit a pre-existing partial, tough thing to do. If we have a really good impression of the crown, we prep the crown and we can go ahead sometimes and just make a duplicate this happens to be in GC pattern resin. Take an impression, a single impression of the tooth and wax our margins on. Cast the thing up. So here's our recast crown fitting the pre-existing partial. Only works if the crown is all gold and if it's in good shape before we ever start. Many times to do a tooth, a crown to fit a pre-existing partial, what the lab wants you to do is reseat the partial in the mouth after the tooth is prepared and tissue packed. And when you take the impression of the tooth, Go ahead and take an impression, pick the partial and the tooth and everything up, send that all to the lab. Disadvantage is what? Patients got to be without their partial during the entire time the crown is fabricated. You've been listening to a production of the University of Michigan School of Dentistry. For more information about Michigan Dentistry, visit us on the web at www.dent.umich.edu.